forward. Okay. So uh, let's let's pray and uh, we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful again for the opportunity to gather like this. Thank you for the technology and help us as we uh, study that uh, you will uh, uh, help us to understand uh, you more and and how we relate to you and how we serve you. We pray in Jesus' name, Amen. amen. Uh, uh, we're on chapter twenty four and. Uh, the the message the part is tonight is on uh, entitled "No Ordinary Man." Uh, there's a lot of material here, um, and I don't really want to rush through it. Uh, so we'll go uh, we'll go for a while, and then uh, we'll see where we are. Next week we will do chapter twenty five, and uh, and then on the twenty first, two weeks from tonight, uh, request per uh, Dave Meyer, we're going to go back and redo the Christmas one that we did. Uh, couple three weeks ago in uh, which I forgot to pun punch record and so then I did a synopsis the next day but I think um, it would be good since that would be the Christmas um, season on the 21st and then we'll take a break between Christmas and New Year's and we'll reconvene back in uh, after the first of the year so we'll get together the next uh, couple weeks tonight next week and uh, on the 21st so so I asked you a question on the worksheet uh, to uh, to tell me what is a parable because Jesus used a lot of uh, parables in his teaching. What is a parable? It's an um, um, a, a a story that's oh, it's a. Uh, it's like metaphor or an analogy or a, a picture that's painted, but it's, it's, uh, you're trying to, it's like when a person tries to paint a picture, but um, I know what it is, but I'm having a terrible time explaining it. You know, it, it's just, it's a picture that's painted that, instead of using the words that you're kind of using um, ideas or um, that's all I'm done. Well, I, th I think you actually uh, described it uh, pretty well. Uh, it is a story that uh, tells a simple or a central truth. Um, uh, you, you can't necessarily always uh, match up every part of the story to a truth, but there's a, uh, there's a basic truth that is being taught with a story. And Jesus uh, used a lot of those. He, he talks about how he did it uh, to, in, in fact, confuse people. Uh, the uh, outsiders, uh, his critics, particularly the, uh, the uh, religious leadership, uh, he told stories and uh, then to his disciples, he would explain them. And so in this chapter, as you were reading through it, you came across several uh, parables. And the first one he, he did was the parable of the sower. And he said, a sower goes out with some seed and he, so, and, you know, he, he throws it out to, uh, to plant it. And uh, some of the seed uh, fell on hard ground and some of the seed fell on rocky ground. And uh, some of the seed fell on thorn uh, covered ground. And then some of it uh, fell on, on good ground and the disciples asked him, well, what do you mean? And uh, he said, the seed is the word of God, the Bible. Uh, and the sower is uh, Jesus. He sowed the, the word, his word. Uh, the, the seed that fell on hard ground uh, was quickly picked up by the birds and carried away. It never took root. It never had a chance. Uh, and uh, it never had any kind of response. The other ground was the rocky ground. And uh, by that he meant uh, there was a, a thin layer of topsoil. The seed uh, took seed, took uh, sprouted, began to grow, but then uh, died off because it had no root. And he, and he talked about the rocky ground uh, is the seed that falls on people who then suffer persecution and uh, the hard times. And in the hard times, they, re they turn and walk away from the word. 
and the thorn uh, covered ground was uh, it fell in that uh, ground and uh, uh, it sprouted it took uh, it took root and came up and then the thorns came and choked it out and Jesus uh, talked about those kind of people who let the cares of this world and riches take away the meaning of the word so you've got the hard ground which uh, uh, has uh, does not take root you have the rocky ground that takes root but troubles come along and people uh, they abandon it they're not interested and the thorn covered ground is uh, the cares of this world and riches and and people, you know, they, they'll be all excited. And then all of a sudden, other things are more important, money and, and, uh, and they lose uh, sight of the, and they reject the word. And then finally was the good ground. And that is the, uh, the seed takes uh, root. Uh, it then grows and it produces fruit. And, uh, and uh, so those were, that was the parable of the sower. And his message was to his listeners is that uh, his uh, his word? Uh, the lovely Mrs. Clementson just arrived. Welcome. Hi there. And uh, and the message was that it's the same seed. It's the same word of God that's planted. Right, the word of God is planted, uh, and only about according to this, about twenty five percent of it takes root and produces. And uh, so the different ground describes um, a, a, a person's heart. Um, uh, the different uh, part types of hearts that people have. Then he, uh, it's uh, Russ and uh, Dave Meyer. Huh. So uh, then he tells a story of the parable of the mustard seed, and uh, in this he talks about how the faith, uh, the kingdom of God, is like a mustard seed. It plants one little seed and it grows and becomes this huge uh, tree, and. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and we know that happened uh, uh, as we look back over history that uh, Jesus uh, planted his uh, seed uh, with his uh, 12 disciples. Uh, Judas, of course, betrays him, which we'll talk about in a future lesson. And uh, from those, uh, those 11 people, plus the others that followed him, uh, we, here we are today, 2,000 years ago, and the kingdom of God has expanded um, multiple times over and over and over again down through the through the ages and then he tells uh, he tells three parables that uh, are designed to deal with the Pharisees criticism of him they uh, Jesus uh, was criticized by the Pharisees because uh, he hung out with people who weren't very nice uh, the tax collectors and the sinners and the prostitutes and all of the people that, uh, you know, the religious leaders of its day and even today are not interested in those kind of people. And so he tells the story of the, of the lost sheep. He had a hundred sheep, 99 of them were, were safe in the fold. One was lost. And what did the shepherd do? He went out and he, and he found the one lost sheep. And then this, he tells the story of a woman who had 10 coins. She lost a coin uh, and spent the rest of her time uh, uh, finding it. And, uh, and then ultimately the prodigal son, which was the story of the two sons who, uh, where their father was wealthy. And the one said, hey, dad, give me all my money. I want to go and, and live my own life. And he left and he went and he spent his money uh, on uh, uh, wild living, ultimately uh, ended up eating uh, uh, pig uh, corn cobs in a pig pen, and he was in there in, in distress, and he realized that, uh, hey, you know, my, my dad has a place where uh, maybe I can just go and, and be again, and of course, he goes home, and the father sees him coming and runs out and embraces him and welcomes him home, which is, of course, the story of uh, Jesus and the way he feels about us when we when we wander away, right? He he is quick to re uh, to to get us, take us back, and restore us. And uh, the other son who stayed behind was complaining to his dad because uh, he he had a big party for him, and and the and the son or the dad said to the son, "Look, uh, you've been here all along. My son who was lost has now come home." And we're going to welcome him again, a picture of the 
of the uh, the love that God has for for us when we wander away. And then the final one was the Good Samaritan. A, a man goes is traveling down the road and he's attacked by thieves and he's beaten and robbed and he's left up for dead on the side of the road. And uh, uh, three people pass. First is a priest. And he, uh, he goes to the other side of the, uh, of the road. Uh, same with the Levite, uh, the religious, both of those are religious leaders. They, uh, they avoid the, the guy that's been mugged. And then finally, the Samaritan comes by and goes and, and uh, uh, you know, bandages up his wounds, takes him to a place and tells the man to take care of him and that he will pay for all of his recovery. And um, of course, the Samaritans were the lower class uh, citizens of that day. And, uh, and so Jesus is teaching them that uh, in this case, who was the friend? And it ultimately was the good Samaritan. I'm going to stop there and, and let, uh, if you have any comments or questions, a lot of material there that I've talked about. Anything you want to add? Not I. I assume, uh, Dave, the fact that you're muting, you don't want to add either. Sorry, no, I'm following along. I'm okay, gonna, all right. Uh, so that's the first section of this of chapter twenty four. Then, then uh, we have the famous Sermon on the Mount, and um, that is a uh, that's Matthew five, six, and seven. Which, by the way, would be a good read for you to to read. Uh, Jesus was speaking to people on the mount uh, overlooking the Sea of Galilee up in northern Israel, near the town of Capernaum, and uh, there's a lot in there. And I just highlighted three. One are the Beatitudes. Blessed is, is the, uh, let me find that real quick. It's a, it's a uh, series of blessings that Jesus, that Jesus uh, talks about. Yeah, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And blessed are those... Uh, who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I actually believe I interpret this, the Beatitudes as a, uh, uh, not, uh, what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different people, but rather a progression that we go through. Uh, where do we begin? Uh, we begin in our relationship with God to be, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Uh, they realize their inadequacy and their uh, need for uh, for God. And in that state, that leads to us a mourning, which is that of repentance, for they shall be comforted. That as it leads us to a, a series of, uh, or a, a state of humility. Blessed are, are the meek. So you've got, hey, I realize I've I got problems. I'm really sorry for those problems. They make me sad. That causes me to humble myself. And then ultimately, when we're in that state of, of humbling ourselves, we then reach out to God and hunger for righteousness, thirst and for righteousness. And when we do that, we shall be filled. And then that in turn leads us to understand the plight of other people and we become merciful. We lost you there for, for a brief yeah. second. Good. Okay. Yeah. About 30 seconds worth, maybe. Okay. Where was I? Talking about the progression. Yeah. The, the, did you hear me say that the Sermon on the Mount is a progression? I think, or the, the Beatitudes are a progression. That's yes. right. We went out. Yep. Okay. And, and you see the progression. And uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. That's when you look at yourself and you go, I'm inadequate. Before God, I'm inadequate. And then uh, that leads us to a state of mourning or sadness for that being that way. Um, 
which in turn then causes us to humble ourselves, we become meek. In that moment of humility, after we've recognized who we are and how desperately we need God, then we begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness, which in turn then allows us to become merciful. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that we do when we understand God's forgiveness, if we genuinely understand God's forgiveness, uh, we are then um, more likely to forgive others and to have compassion for others, which in turn leads us to have a pure heart. Ultimately, we become peacemakers. And then uh, the more we serve God, we face uh, persecution. Uh, I, that's the way I look at this passage, rather than uh, uh, what? Uh, eight, different, eight different people. I look at this as a progression of our spiritual growth. And um, I don't know if other people uh, hold that view, but that's what I do. Those are the Beatitudes. They're called the Beatitudes. The word beatitude simply means blessing. And, and Jesus in each one of those verses has said, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, and so on. Then in this passage, we have the famous Lord's Prayer in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 6. And uh, Jesus tells us to pray like this. And, you know, we recite this uh, Lord's Prayer a lot of times, and it's perfectly fine to, to recite it. But really what you're saying is you're seeing how we pray, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Uh, we, uh, we begin our prayer with extolling God's greatness. Hallowed be thy name. And then we pray that your will be done on uh, earth as it is in heaven. Uh, so many times we pray as if God is Santa Claus, right? Give me this, give me that, uh, do this for me, fix that or whatever. But uh, we, are to, we are to pray in his will. And then there's give us this, our, this day our daily bread. We pray for provision in our life. And, uh, and then forgive us our debts as we forgive our, de our debtors. So we ask God for forgiveness. And with that comes the, uh, the desire or the hope that, uh, that we also will forgive others. And then ultimately he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Uh, so that's the Lord's Prayer. And then uh, he goes on, uh, again, there's a whole bunch in here, and I would just, I would encourage you, if you've never read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, that's a good passage to, uh, to listen. Uh, but uh, he closes out uh, chapter 6, uh, and he talks about not being anxious. He says, therefore, in verse 25, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you would drink, or, nor about your body, what you will put on is not life more than food. Uh, and he goes on to build, build this up. You know, we, we become so focused sometimes on, uh, on what we want and what we need. And Jesus said, let's stop focusing on that. And then he concludes that section, verse 33 but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, that is all these things that we worry about will be added to you. And then he says, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So what he's telling us in that section is that we should live in the moment, right? I mean, it's not that we don't plan ahead. We do plan ahead, but uh, if you're like me, I, I, I tend to worry about stuff all the time spread over the future when in fact we uh we should we should not do that and it's easier said than done right so that's the sermon on the mount and again i would encourage you to read that uh all uh, those three chapters they're really good they're uh, <laughs> so any uh any any thoughts or comments so far did you hear me all right yes sir Okay, yes, then, he goes on, then he goes on and he begins to uh, per, uh, perform uh, some uh, miracles. He, uh, he casts out the uh, demon, possessed man, casts the demons out of the, uh, the man in the, uh, in the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake, uh, the Sea of Galilee. And uh, he was a raving lunatic and they, they tried to bind him with chains, but he would break them. 
and then ultimately uh, Jesus cast out the demons and uh, he became a, a, a witness for Jesus. He said to Jesus, I'd like to go with you. And he said, no, I want you to stay here and tell your story. And so he did. And then he, he raised the, the dead girl. Uh, and uh, I think that was uh, John 10, was it? I don't remember. Anyway, uh, he came to the house and they all laughed at him and, and he raised the little girl up uh, from the dead. And then it was during this time that John the Baptist was actually murdered by Herod. And uh, uh, Jesus heard about it. And uh, and then the, there was the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, uh, all of this has taken place up in the Sea of Galilee. Jesus has not gone down to Jerusalem yet. <clears throat> and he fed 5,000 plus uh, men, plus women and children, probably, you know, 15, 20,000 people he fed. And uh, he told the disciples to uh, just, feed, they wanted to send them away. And, and uh, Jesus said, well, why don't you feed them? Well, of course, uh, how are we going to do that? And there was a little boy with five loaves and two fish. And Jesus uh, sent them, had them all sit down. And uh, he started breaking the bread. He prayed and broke the bread and the fish and began to hand it out. And the, everybody was fed to the point where there were 12 baskets left over for the 12 disciples. And uh, so, and then after that, Jesus sends his disciples across the Sea of Galilee. He goes aside alone and a storm comes up and engulfs the disciples. And remember, they were fishermen, so they'd been at sea before. They knew what rough water was, but this was a really bad uh, storm. And then um, they're all scared and Jesus comes walking on the water and they think it's a ghost. And um the John account talks about how Peter sees him and says, you know, let me come and walk to you. And, and I have a question real quick. Yeah. Back to the 12 baskets that were left over. Yeah. Uh, was, what is the tale of that? Um, there, there's something about the 12 baskets. I'm trying to think off the top of my head that was, uh, uh, that Jesus did not approve of or that he thought that they may have taken advantage of or somebody stole some. I can't remember exactly, but do you recall more to the story of the 12 baskets? No, I've never, I've never okay. heard anything like that, Dave. Okay. That's, uh, that's something I've never heard of. Do you, did you hear that somewhere? Obviously. Yeah, somewhere, but uh, I can't remember the, the actual events involved. Um, but there was something about the 12 baskets that, that wasn't exactly as Jesus had planned. Um, but I can't remember what it was. Oh, and I didn't want sure if you, you knew what that was or not. No, I, uh, I, uh, the account is in John six. Uh, there, there's no comment there in John six, uh, that would suggest that there was any any problem with that. Okay, good. Yeah. So yeah, I've never heard that before. Uh, and so anyway, he sends him uh, across the uh, the sea, and he walks to him on the water. And Peter comes out, and you know, sometimes we uh, those that know the story of Peter walking on the water kind of criticize him because he took his eyes off Jesus and began to sink. I think it's pretty brave that he got out there to begin with. So let's give him some credit. <laughs> so uh, anyway, he comes walking on the water. John is the only account that, that records that. Uh, and anyway, the storm, uh, uh, he gets in the boat. The storm uh, dies away. They get over to the other side. And there um, the crowd shows up again. And Jesus is very blunt with them. He says, look, I know why you're here. You want breakfast. And um, I'm not feeding you breakfast. And uh, so they all, they got mad and walked away. And that's where he introduces uh, himself as the bread of life. And uh, it's always interesting how uh, Jesus, uh, Jesus didn't sugarcoat stuff. Um, he, uh, he told it like it was. And, and most all of them uh, fed, uh, fled away. 
when they found out they weren't going to get something to uh, eat from him. So uh, the uh, let me just give you the quick lessons because on our uh, on our uh, lesson here, we only have a few minutes left. Jesus always brought uh, brought a message. His message was a message that most people didn't want to hear. Um, the second thing is he hung out with a lower strata of society. He was always with sinners and the uh, and those that uh, were less than what society were, thought were good people. Uh, and he avoided the religious re, uh, elite. In fact, he criticized them greatly. Uh, all of Jesus' miracles were uh, had practical results, right? He didn't just perform miracles to put a show on. He put on uh, to heal people who were sick. He raised the little girl from the dead, brought her back to life. Uh, he fed the hungry. His miracles were always a uh, had a practical. And then finally, his primary message was a spiritual one. Uh, Jesus did not come to overthrow Rome and set up an earthly kingdom, but rather to establish a spiritual kingdom that will one day rule the world. Now, in Revelation, he's coming back and gonna gonna set up a a kingdom, a physical kingdom, but the kingdom that he brought in the Gospels was a spiritual kingdom that is achieved uh, by faith in him. So uh, I did get through it. Are there any final comments? We've got about seven minutes that we can use on our free Zoom. So I did get through it. I, I trust that you didn't find it too overwhelming. Wonderful. Fabulous. You did well. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, we will see you next week, Dave. Get home safe. Uh, tell your lovely bride when you talk to her hello. Yeah. And I'm going to stop the recording, and we'll see you next week.